Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 141, and I actually recorded this episode last year when I was in Schenectady, New York at Union College. I sat down with Jason Benitez at Union College. He is the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion there at the school, and uh, he's the Director of Multicultural Affairs as well. And really, it's his job to bring people together, help them understand each other. And this day and age, it's not an easy task, I feel like. Um, This seemed like a really good week to put this episode out, given that uh, we just celebrated Martin Luther King Jr.'s day uh, in honor of Dr. King's birthday and his legacy. And since he certainly is someone who evokes the concept of understanding and diversity and uh, coming together multiculturally, uh, religiously, ethnically, you know, all the stuff, it just it seemed like a no brainer. So Jason was uh, very kind to give of his time. He's a busy guy there up at the at the university and. Shout out to uh, Dr. Yasmin uh, Van Wilt, who helped facilitate and organize uh, the episode for me. I appreciate that, too. Um, Usual stuff. Hey, human can be found on all the social medias, of course, Facebook, Instagram, uh, under Hey Human Podcast. I am on Twitter under Susan Ruth Ism. And of course, you could find me on Facebook and Instagram under those handles as well, under the Susan Ruth Ism handle. If you shop Amazon, please do so through the Amazon portal on heyhumanpodcast.com. And while you're at it and you're on the website, check out the links page. I try and uh, put some interesting links and books and things uh, for every episode. So definitely check that out. Uh, You can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. Love to hear from you. And rate and review Hey Human on iTunes. That would be awesome. It's very helpful. Um, It only takes a few minutes of your time, and I'd really appreciate it. Uh, My apologies to those of you who listen to the podcast through Stitcher. Uh, Apparently, the RSS feed code or whatever was uh, wrong. That got fixed, so the last seven episodes that were missing on Stitcher app are now back. Everything should be back to normal, so shout out to Stitcher for helping to get that uh, all squared away. Of course, you can listen to the podcast wherever you're listening to it right now. You've already figured it out. So um, keep on listening and thank you and um, shine a little light in the world, yeah? Let's uh, let's try and uh, root out the darkness and, and uh, let the light shine in. Isn't there an old song? I seem to remember when I was little... There was a record that I played. I picked it up at a garage sale for like, I don't know, a quarter or something. And I just remember playing on my Fisher Price record player this album. I I can vaguely recall the cover of it. It had Easter Parade on this album, um, uh, songs about bonnets and birds and things. But one of the songs was "Open Up Your Heart and Let the Love sh- and Let Open Up Your Heart and Let the Sun Shine In." That's how it went. Man, I used to listen to that song over and over again, and it just, you know, seems like a good way to be. So just a little throwback memory (laughs) from my random childhood. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm glad you're here. And uh, here we go. Jason Benitez, welcome to Hey Human Podcast. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, Tell me about you. Tell me about what it is that you do here at Union and and your the scope of your work. Okay, yes. Well, um, again, I'm the Director for Multicultural Affairs, and I report to our Chief Diversity Officer. So basically the scope of my work day-to-day here at Union entails uh, fostering diversity and inclusion in its many forms. Um, that can range from doing events, trainings, and programs to also working on like policy and procedure behind the scenes. So um, whatever is really needed, whatever we kind of need to look at on our campus, whether that's admissions, uh, a lot of campus climate work, we're constantly kind of assessing campus climate, listening to students, keeping our ear to the ground. What are students really experiencing, not only in the classroom, but in social settings as well. 
and really just doing whatever we can to make sure that our campus is more welcoming and inclusive of all our students, regardless of identity, background, where they're coming from. So um, yeah, that's pretty much in a nutshell what we do. It, it involves a lot more <laughs> than that, but I would say fostering diversity and inclusion in its many forms is um, in a nutshell kind of the work that I, I do. Does that mean as far as admissions are concerned or once they're on campus? I mean, how, how do, what does that yeah. mean to you? Occasionally I will um, liaise with the admissions department if they need uh, assistance in looking at a particular student or assessing a particular class. But I would say more more so it's the work after the student is accepted and arrives to union. It's, it's um, again, making sure our, our course offerings, our social outlets, um, our services are just inclusive mm -hmm. and welcoming. And I think that um, it's kind of my job to understand the many lenses that our students are bringing mm -hmm. and the realities that they face and then translate that to the faculty and administrators um, to kind of help us all better understand um, the reality that our students are bringing to our campus and how they can then contribute to our campus community. So, so this is historically a, a school that it's an older school. Yes. Yes. Very so, much so historically, it's been white. I mean, we just, correct. Yeah. Throw that out there. <laughs> and and all male. Um, we we just went gender coed in the 1970s. So. Oh my gosh! Really? Right. Yes. Fascinating. Yes. Okay. So how was? You know, obviously, you weren't here then. But <laughs> but for a transition like that, uh, how how does one go about that? Um, I, I I think baby steps. Uh, I think, but consistent baby steps. I always say to students. You know, consistent baby steps can soon become giant leaps. So mm -hmm. I think as long as you have some dedicated individuals, both student and faculty staff wise on a campus that are looking to make the campus more progressive, more inclusive, um, it happens slowly as most change does. But I be believe fully um, that that for a while now, we've really been moving in the right direction. And, um, you know, I'm President Ainley, who's about to, you know, step down as president this year, um, the the number of students of color admitted to union nearly doubled in his tenure in his last 12 years. So, I think I arrived at union at a time where union was really ripe for change, mm -hmm. um, and some of the kind of groundwork momentum had already happened. Mm -hmm. So I I feel fortunate enough that I arrived at a time where I get to kind of ride the wave a little bit, so to speak. Um, so. How do you go about making students feel more included then? If you have a diverse group, and that includes gender diverse too. Everything, right? you know, yes. and, and sexual orientation diverse, Absolutely. all of that. So how, the co college years are so informative <laughs> and, and, and people are changing rapidly of who yes. they are and what they think. How do you encompass all of that maelstrom of... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of layers uh, to that onion you just presented. Absolutely. I think that in general, college can be a time where students are really exploring the identity, who they really are, mm -hmm. kind of re refinding themselves in many ways. Um, and yes, we do subscribe to a, a really wide definition of diversity. So it's, it's not just kind of racial, ethnic, but we look at gender, you know, gender, gender identity, sexuality, um, ethnic background, geographic background, uh, also um, socioeconomic kind of matters on campus. So those all uh, contribute to the... And religion, I imagine. And religion, um, yes, absolutely. And religion, um, uh, absolutely. So we have... Um, so how do I do that? I guess it's, it's about listening and it's about really being on the ground level. I think that what, what I've seen happening in some other campuses with a lot of the student unrest that led to, in extreme cases, like sit-ins and demonstrations and protests. Um, thankfully, I feel at Union, we, we, we haven't seen that as much. I think it's because administrators like myself, um, like our Director of Religious and Spiritual Life, like our Chief Diversity Officer, we're very visible, we're very accessible, mm -hmm. and we're very on the ground with the students, like almost daily. Um, my office immediately connected to my office is a student lounge, so that offers me the, the advantage of really getting to see and hear what they're talking about day to day. So I think it's about 
that transparency and that relationship and being visible and being accessible. The students, I'm, I'm not trying to say that we don't have issues. We, we def- Anytime you have a coming together of so many different people, there are naturally going to be some friction. Sure. But I think um, the students, when an issue does come up, they know where to go and they know our faces and they know us by first name basis mm-hmm. and they're comfortable approaching us with matters that may be uncomfortable to approach you know other faculty or other administrators with so i think that that's a big part of it is that we are very around accessible and aware of what's going on so when things do start to bubble up we are right there and can you know, collaborate, work out solutions, pull together the right people to address what might be going on. So um, I guess that's the main way I would say that we kind of navigate the the cacophony of what can happen <laughs> here. So it's a great word. I love that word. <laughs> you just came off of a big conference. Is that a uh, social justice retreat? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wait, tell me about that. So a few weekends back and we always do it the weekend right after the MLK holiday because we like to make it a week of social justice related events in kind of the spirit of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Um, So for this two weekends ago, it was the fifth annual uh, social justice retreat and we call it our next step social justice retreat. It's titled next step because it's not so much about what happens during the retreat, but what are they going to do next with the knowledge and the awareness they raise. But um, I would say by far this program has become kind of the signature program for my office throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And um, this past year, we had a, about 55 students attend. I am proud to say that this past year, I feel represented a wider cross section of campus populations than any retreat before. Um, you know, there's always in diversity and inclusion work, there, there are those that are a little bit harder to reach and harder to engage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this year due to a lot of legwork and you know, personalization that we did in the outreach that we were able to get a truer cross-section of our campus population at the retreat. Um, So you have diverse students from many different backgrounds and beliefs coming together for a day and a half. It's very intense as far as, you know, um, it's a really long day on the Saturday and most of the Friday night. And we just engage them in a number of small group activities, small group dialogues, large group activities and dialogues that really bring to the surface matters of power, privilege, discrimination, Uh, inclusion, equity, um, and really engage in a genuine way in these dialogues with them. And students report back continually over the years that not only the types of people that they can connect with, but the types of conversation that they're having at this retreat is very hard to find in other spaces at Union College. And it's partially due to kind of like the the click-like social nature that can happen. So these students are coming together with students where they otherwise wouldn't connect with. Mm -hmm. And I think that in and of itself is a big plus. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, exposure is a big part of awareness raising. How are the students selected? Do they do they volunteer or do you go throughout the community of students and say, all right, you and you (laughs) and you? Well, we do um, market it generally to the entire student body. And then I personally go to some targeted groups on campus um, to try to elicit more, excuse me, uh, participation. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's an application process, so we do send out a a Google form with, um, you know, an application questions, and they have to submit um, some short answers. Uh, But honestly, we're not very um, exclusive. We want to try to include as many students that want to be there. Um, we, you know, have to have a cap at times numbers wise with the space and the the budget we have, but we've been able to accommodate, um, anybody that's been interested. Um, and I think the other beauty is that when we're in large groups, um, we're, we're facilitating together, but when they break out into small groups, those small groups are led by a faculty or staff member on campus, um, paired up with a student who had previously attended the retreat. Mm. So it offers students who've come to the retreat before an opportunity to step up their leadership and they help co-facilitate small group with a faculty or staff member. So this year we had five faculty and staff paired up with five students who went through the retreat and those 10 were our facilitation team. So So how many students actually attend this retreat? Um, This past year we had about 55 attend. Okay. And that's kind of, I would say, around average numbers. Do you feel like... 
I feel like the people that would say, hey, that looks like something I'd want to attend are the people that already have a, <laughs> already in the club. You know what I mean? They're already seeking the concepts of diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion and, and already have that wrapped around their hearts. So w the people that don't want to attend, how <laughs> yes. do you engage those people? Because they're really the ones that probably need it most, right? That is the conundrum of diversity work in a nutshell. Yeah. I, uh, often, uh, if you're not careful, we call it the choir. The choir, the folks that are already aware of diversity and social justice work tend to be the ones that come to the event. Um, but the choir needs practice, I will say that. Uh, the choir needs to rehearse. Um, so how I think, you know, let me see, how, how can I explain? So um, with this particular retreat, I think bringing students with an, uh, if you look at an awareness of social justice issues as a spectrum, mm -hmm. I think it's it's makes for a better retreat when you have students kind of, season that have a little bit of knowledge and awareness and work in this area with students who may be attending this retreat and hearing about social justice issues for the first time. I think that mix and bringing students on that kind of spectrum is what makes a more authentic retreat. Um, I can be honest and say that um, I, I understand completely what you're saying and um, it's, it's particularly in diversity work, it's cisgender, heterosexual white men that I would say are the hardest to reach and engage. Yeah, I would imagine. I, I think there's this, um, maybe that's not for me, or where do I fit in? Like there's this kind of not seeing where they can come in on the conversation. So one of the reasons I'm proud of this past retreat is because again, I think due to more personalized outreach, I, I went in the fall term and I went to athletic team meetings mm -hmm. and I went to um, Greek houses, you know, and I really, try to pitch the retreat in a way that shows particularly these young men um, that they do have a seat at the table, mm -hmm. that there are these conversations going on weekly on campuses and there's always this piece of the puzzle that's missing. But um, so in that way, we hopefully avoid what we call the echo chamber because when you surround yourself with people of similar thinking, then you're just, you know, kind of reiterating the same message. But it's not until I think you bring a diversity of thought and idea and belief to the table and really engage those students in uncomfortable dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and I really try to promote that, you know, discomfort doesn't mean unsafe. I think sometimes our students believe really good point. that like, this is gonna be unsafe for me. Yeah. And I tell them all the time, it'll be safe discomfort. <laughs> you know, you may be uncomfortable, but it will be safe. Yeah. So I think that at the end of the day, at the end of the second day of the retreat, our students um, it starts to click and they grasp that and they begin to see, I, I, it's almost amazing. I watch and it, you, it's almost like you see the divide, the things that divide us go away and the mm -hmm. walls go down mm -hmm. and the vibe that's fostered in that space is really um, a beautiful thing to watch and it's very inclusive. And so. then they become ambassadors for the campaign for the next year around, I suppose. That is the hope. Yeah. That is the hope and hopefully some of them will even go a step further and apply to be a facilitator in the, in the subsequent years. So... Um, you know, that's a, a little bit of the reason why it's entitled Next Step is because we really try to stress uh, what are you going to do now? Um, we, the, the retreat finishes with like a personal action statement where they have to kind of map out what they're committing to doing different on, co on our campus and beyond. So um, it's, it's, it's been, it's, I think, very successful. The feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. And again, we're, we're, we just finished our fifth year. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you had mentioned, and to, not surprising to me, that the hardest to get to come in, mm -hmm. the cis-normative white male. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've read articles just in, in passing and such that uh, some folks feel like they are a dying, you know, they're clinging to their, mm -hmm. they think they are being challenged and that they are a minority mm -hmm. in all this. So how do you, if somebody comes to you with that mentality, how do you deal with that to say like, well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> yes. you have the power play yes. there. You know, how do you how do you help frame, especially a young mind who's very yes. vulnerable in its own way? And um, how do you frame that? That 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 is a tough one. I I don't I don't um, say what I've just said about you know cisgender heterosexual white men at, to, 
as a way to criticize or to, no, to alienate. Not. Sure. I think it's just the reality of what I've seen in diversity work that that group, that kind of section of our of our community tends to be the least engaged. But sure. I think that um, how I do it, it's it's tough. I think you you try to focus on where the similarities are and maybe that that marginalization that you have expressed that that you know in articles that we're reading that some of these um you know communities are beginning to feel like entrenched the face of the nation is changing and maybe their their status is is being compromised or challenged um i try to use that as a point of connection to say that all right you're feeling the beginnings of this marginalization now, you know, let's examine someone from another identity or another background that maybe from the moment they were born has felt that way. And let's come together and try to talk about how that feels for the both of you. And if you if if you can try to come out of your comfort zone to understand how another community is marginalized, then there can be connection and, and power in that joint kind of experience it could be an aha moment exactly yeah. exactly so and again it, um the only way we're going to make our country great again is together <laughs> so that's another big thing i push on students is that that this divisiveness that we're feeling is like something it's almost like a challenge in their generation like they're the ones that can really um help us eliminate that divide that we've been feeling lately yeah. and it's kind of on them to be the next generation of of more inclusive more engaged, more embracing humans. Yeah. I do think it's interesting that when you, you know, not you, but the royal you, mm. ramble off things like, you know, cis, normative, white, mm. male, suddenly everyone tenses up, you know, and they think, well, what are you putting me in this little <laughs> spot? And, and uh, to your point, it isn't to vilify all mm-hmm. white guys that were born heterosexual, obviously, right. but that is truly, you know, a power position in this country and in other countries. Um, And I think when you hold power, that it is so important to realize that there are people around you that you can lift up and join you at the seat of the table. And it doesn't denote you. It doesn't make you less than. In fact, you are more powerful because of those who are around you. Precisely. So it's that conversation. And I, I wish that the rhetoric could be could seep in a little bit that it's like, no, we're not trying to stab you in the face. We're trying to help you break bread. Precisely. Precisely. I think the, the P word, the privilege word is becoming like a little bit of a, a a conversation (laughs) stopper in some settings that uh, I've noticed that when I bring up that word privilege, that, you know, some immediately shut off or shut down. Mm -hmm. But I really try to promote with our students that, that privilege doesn't need to be a bad word. Um, and when I say to a student or get them to recognize a privilege, it's it's not as if I'm saying you your family didn't work hard to get you where you are or that you haven't struggled personally to get to where you are. So I try to, I, I think when some hear that word privilege, that's the message that they take, mm. that somehow they've had it easy. Mm-hmm. But what I try to promote is that, no, privilege simply just means that do, you know, you were born into an, an unearned kind of category of individual and due to the dynamics of overall society that likes to you know, create things on a hierarchy mm-hmm. chart, your skin, your gender, your sexuality, your religion um, that you're born into through no choice of your own is, is, is higher on that chart of hierarchy. And that's not a bad thing. It, it's about hopefully, and again, going back to the retreat, we try to instill that to use your privilege mm-hmm. in a way to uplift, like I might be able to get a message across to people that maybe someone else can't because of my male privilege or my hetero privilege or my skin privilege even. Um, and I think that a great thing about this retreat is helping students to see where um, privilege isn't necessarily a bad word or something to recoil from, but mm-hmm. it's something to be aware of, embrace, and then hopefully utilize that elevated platform to create greater inclusion. Yeah, so. it's, it can be used, it's a strength to strengthen others. Correct, yeah. correct, yeah. correct. But again, people love to vilify things, right? It makes that othering sure feels good. Abs- and even, even, even for the kings <laughs> and the queens. <laughs> so uh, how did your own upbringing shape what you do now? I'm curious, what brought you to this yes. profession? Great. 
Um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so I, I attended public school. And, um, I'm, you know, although I identify with a Latinx kind of identity, I'm not the, you know, darkest skin. And yeah, I grew yeah, up in a neighborhood of mostly West Indian and Caribbean folks. So I, I often say that I felt like I was a minority amongst minorities. Um, but I think that that those early years in high school and coming up in Brooklyn really shaped kind of um, my awareness of certain issues. And I was able to maybe see things through my own experiences that um, helped me later in life. Um, and then I attended UAlbany for my undergrad as an EOP student, Educational Opportunity Program. And um, I, I just, I don't know, I just gravitated toward diversity programs and meeting new people and helping particularly marginalized students, you know, knowing what it was like myself as a male of color coming up through higher ed um, and a particularly a low income student. Um, I think I was living the marginalized experience on some level. Mm -hmm. So as I began to go on to grad school and into my career, I really was trying to be kind of profoundly aware of, you know, where are the students that are on the margins and how can we operate in a way with our policies, practices, and, you know, things on campus to bring them into the margins. So I think over time, it kind of just, you know, momentum just built. And I started in res life work, working in the residence halls. And I think through all those positions, I was able to really be front, you know, first row to like the reality of what students are facing financially, socially, culturally, religious wise on campus. Mm -hmm. And then I just would constantly think about how can I make those experiences better for these students. Um, so I would say those are some of the, the things that helped shape me, you know, yeah. in college and then early in my career is, is really bringing an understanding to these students of what it's like, because I feel like in many ways, I may have walked down the path that they're now on. So I'm aware of where maybe some of the bumps in the road are. And I like kind of that mentoring, um, that mentoring role that I can play with students as well. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned earlier about uh, the spirituality aspect yes. of things and the spirituality center. What, what was the? We have a director of religious and spiritual life on our campus. And she, myself, and our chief diversity officer make up the I guess what we call the division of diversity and inclusion, even though we're only a division of three. <laughs> Do you find that uh, by utilizing that, that structure of spirituality and religion, it's easier to get um, the young adults here to to see beyond their own microcosm yes. of being? Does that help or does it make not much of a difference? Absolutely. I think it does help. I think um, more and more uh, we're seeing students that are the, the number of students that are coming to campus that identify with an organized religion has been decreasing over time. Um, so you're, we're finding many more agnostics and atheists or just students who don't formally kind of associate with a religion. Um, but I think having a religious and spiritual life director, um, having a um, student groups that are focused on religion. So we have a Muslim student association, Catholic students uh, group. We have um, two groups um, for students of the Jewish faith. Um, I think that those groups, in addition to our director of religious and spiritual life, kind of help spirituality and religious um, kind of identity be present on our campus mm -hmm. and foster that a little bit and mm -hmm. create more conversation. Um, we also, we, we have a chapter of... Um, an Obama era administration, uh, the Interfaith Youth Corps. So we're we're uh, sponsoring campus, and these are, um, I guess, interfaith student groups across the country. And we have a group here that um, the sole purpose is to try to bring students of different faith backgrounds together, again to see the commonalities, to see how they can work together. And uh, those groups are very active and are constantly having dinners and discussions. And that's great. Um, often specifically reaching out to us, you know, another group of students from a different faith to do a joint collaborative program or dinner. Um, so I think those are some of the ways that we help kind of foster the religious and spiritual life on campus and, you know, also recognize that that, that aspect of the students' lives is a, is a part of what informs them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So since that program is across the U.S., is the is the other one your retreat? Are you going to grow that and have it be inclusive of other colleges, perhaps? Maybe 
have a have bigger I, I think with the particular retreat, because a lot of what we talk about is really specific to union ah, campus okay. dynamics, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure we're at a point where we would necessarily open it up to other campuses at the moment. Mm -hmm. I do see the value in having cross-campus initiatives and dialogues, and I'm, I myself am familiar with some of the, my counterparts in the capital region that do this work, and we've talked at times about doing some joint programming, um, but I think Again, much of what we discuss and much of what comes out in the dialogue at our retreat is really so specific to Union's campus. And I feel this campus still needs, you know, considerable considerable amount of work, particularly in social student realm, on being more inclusive. So for now, um, I think we're, we're just kind of focusing on our own campus matters. So. What do you mean by social student realm? I, um, I think that a lot of the stories of uninclusion or discriminatory behavior that I hear from students don't always happen in the classroom. They happen in more social settings. Mm. So it's uh, at a party, in the cafeteria, in the residence hall. So I think um, when we have these dialogues, a lot of those examples come up. Okay. Um, and so, I you know, see. we can't be, administrators can't be everywhere 24-7. So we really just try to instill in the students that, it's up to you all. It's up to you all to deem what's acceptable on our campus and what's not. And to have a voice. I mean, I think that's incredibly important to, to if you hear, it's sort of like the airport thing. If you if hear you something, something, say, say something. something. <laughs> yeah, if you hear something, if you see something um, to speak up, it's, it's so important to be a human being and mm -hmm. to look as each other's keeper. You know, I, I think that's hugely important. That's one of the messages we, messages we drive home. And when I was going back to social setting, I just think when you can carve out intentional space and bring these students together, the types of conversations that they can have are phenomenal. Mm. But when they when that group breaks and they go back to their, I guess, regular lives, regular lives yeah. and their regular social settings, now you have the, the, the kind of the peer pressure and social dynamics added in that mix. And I think that that, for some students, makes it a little bit more challenging sure. to speak up or say the right thing in the right moment or challenge one of their buddies on something, on behavior. Um, but, I, th again, I think a couple of the activities we do role model how to do that and um, how to step in, how to intervene, how to use your privilege or your status on campus to create greater inclusion in, in small moments and in bigger ways. Even status amongst friends, because there's a hierarchy in, in friend groups, obviously, as well. Yes. So, uh, when, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so that's that's something to definitely... And I think if our students are not careful, they can come from a homogenous background, and if they're not, you know, deliberate about their friend circle at Union, they can continue to surround themselves with a homogenous social circle. Yeah. And then I wonder how much really growing culturally and that you know spiritually and religiously are you really doing because if you just stay in the zone where you're comfortable then how much growth is really occurring because that is the only way to know yourself is by constantly putting these mirrors in front of yourself and if you're always looking at something that is identical to you you never grow you never learn outside of that little perfect box that is it's really a mythology mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. I th I don't think ninety nine percent of the uninclusive moments or discriminatory moments that happen on campus ninety nine percent of them I don't think are coming from a place of ill will or malintent. I think it's genuinely due to lack of exposure um, and lack of awareness. And I think that you can never get to the awareness unless you have the exposure. And I think again, students. Some of our students are coming from a homogenous. K through 12 background, sure. so they just have never had an opportunity to engage with the other, whatever the other may be. Um, and I think that that's where we come in. We try to foster those opportunities, let the students know that it's okay, it's safe, it may be a little awkward, uncomfortable, something you're not used to, but um, but it's not you know unsafe, and we can do this, and we can come together, and just that sheer exposure, I think, over time creates a little bit of an enhanced awareness. So I, I constantly am challenging students to go to something, go to an event, speak to somebody new. You know, like you mentioned, don't don't just engage with the person in the mirror. You know, um, 
come out of that box a little bit and try to yeah. learn about something new. Also, I think it's important to look at oneself and say, all right, why am I getting uncomfortable? Why is sitting here with this person that looks different or loves different or, you know, whatever? Mm-hmm. You know, why does that make me uncomfortable? Where is it in me? And and start there, too, because, again, as I say often, without empathy for ourselves, we can't have empathy for others. Without understanding for ourselves, we can't have understanding for others. It starts with, you know, it starts here inside. Yes. And, and goes outward. Absolutely. And that safety net of like, oh, you look like me, you think like <laughs> me, that feels good. It's a placation. Um, and But it's a really beautiful thing to break free of that and to be uncomfortable Absolutely. for a minute and then go, oh my gosh, what a glorious world this is. Yeah. Full up of so many things. Yes. Um, absolutely. I think we gravitate to what we're comfortable with and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I know there's, you know, that's n- human I nature. I eat quesadilla every morning because it's my favorite <laughs> okay. and I am boring. <laughs> I eat it every morning. It makes me feel good. <laughs> so once in a while, switch it up and, yeah. you know, try something new. You know, you don't, you don't know what you don't like or will like. But it's comfort until... is, is, especially in a chaotic world. Right. Finding an oasis of comfort is, it's understandable. Mm-hmm. But sometimes dipping your toe in the ocean that's a good idea. Yes, I get that's a great metaphor. So yes, we try as much as possible to get our students to dip their toes in, in waters they haven't stepped in before. Yeah, so. that's wonderful. <laughs> Jason Benitez, thank you so much for being on Hey Human. This, thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.